Hi, I'm Zainab Ja, and I'm here with my husband, Timothy Naylor. Hello, Tim Naylor here. Yes, we're the filmmakers of a, a film reunion. It's a short film, and we kind of met. When did we meet? How did we come to making this film? Oh, when, when we met, that was ages ago, but uh, the film, uh, we made it two summers ago, and... Well, my wife, she's been working in front of the camera for a long time, and I've been working behind the camera as a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. And we had this story in our head for the longest time. And ages ago, I wrote a first draft on it. And we just kind of put it to bed. And then my wife said, hey, let's make that film. And then I handed the draft over to her, and you take it from there. And then he ended up the draft over to me and I did my magic things, which is like rewrite it, rewrite it and bolster it and just bring a few more personal touches to it. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next two hours. We're going to talk about the film. First, you're going to see the film. We're going to talk about it and then we're going to um, break it down, how it came about in terms of the writing, the casting, the technical aspects, which he is the DP and we co-wrote and co-directed it together. So there you go. So without further ado, maybe, what do you, do you want to say? Let's well, I, I just want to say this is kind of a proof of concept that married couples can work together <laughs> behind the camera and go through a production and still end up married. That's all. Before we go on, I, I just wanted to talk a bit about our background. Let me start. Okay, so my background is my family is from Sierra Leone in West Africa. I was born in London, grew up in Sierra Leone in West Africa, uh, specifically the city of Freetown, uh, which is like, basically, it's a coastal town. I grew up on the beach. And then I spent, so my formative years were in West Africa. And then when I was 10 years old, I moved back to London to be with my family. And I was a dancer for many years. When I left school, I went to a conservatory where I was a professional, I became a professional modern dancer for a few years. And then uh, one day I was going, I was coming to visit New York, never been before. And so friends of mine in London gave me numbers of people who could show me around and Tim was one of them. And that's how we met. And the rest they say is history. It was love at first sight. So there you go. So I was still a dancer when I first met him. And that's my background in a little nutshell, hence the accent and everything. <laughs> well, my background, I was born and raised in Michigan. Uh, it's an exotic little town. <laughs> looks like this. And the state is exotic. Yeah. The town is Ann Arbor. Yeah, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. <laughs> um, both my folks were professors there. And I moved to New York to go to grad school at New York, New York University to study film. And I haven't left since, and that was, that was decades ago. And what else? Um, after getting out of film school, um, like anybody getting out of school, you, the first thing you, you're looking for is a job. And when I was in film school, everybody used to pick me to shoot their films as the cinematographer. And I come from a fine art background, so getting a composition and lining things up in a camera kind of came second nature, but I felt it was even better because I didn't have to draw it out. And so I, I took to camera like a duck to water. And so I, I shot a lot of films when I was in grad school. So upon leaving, I started working in uh, New York's very vibrant independent film scene at the time. And so I shot a lot of independent films. Then fast forward many years later, I I've worked on TV shows like Inside Amy Schumer, um, Filthy Rich for Netflix, and I worked as a camera operator on the movie Shame. And um, I shoot a lot of documentaries, commercials, and shooting another film this spring. But uh, that's my day job. But uh, my true passion and love is actually writing and directing films. And I guess we'll talk a little bit about the genesis of this project. Um, my wife had read a story in the New York Times that kind of that's relevant to what you just saw. I'll let her take it over from there. Yes, I had read this story in the New York Times at the time. Uh, my country that I grew up in, Sierra Leone, 
was going through, I think it was in the middle of or towards the end of this horrible, brutal 15, 20 year civil war. And there were a lot of um, atrocities committed, as you can imagine, in these in these this war. And because there was a war going on in Liberia next door at the same time, too, which was like, ugh. anyway, so New York Times, I was here. I was still working as a dancer at the time. Not quite. I hadn't really segued into acting yet. I've been acting for about 15 years now, at least 15 years. But at the same at the time, I was a, still a modern dancer and living in New York. And I remember reading this story in the New York Times about these refugees um, who were staying in an asylum in Staten Island. And they were also sharing the asylum uh, facilities with the actual perpetrators of the war. So these refugees from Sierra Leone who were like basically this horrible, um, one of the horrible things they did was the hacking of limbs, um, hands and feet and all that. And it was brutal. It was one of those things. Um, my dad is an orthopedic surgeon. And his job with, basically was getting prosthetics given, distributed to these people who can't even afford it because it's one of the poorest countries in the world. It was at the time and still remains so. They're trying. They're on the up, but still. And so there were these horrible pictures of these children on the beach, you know, missing arms and legs. And then I thought about the story of these um, asylum speak seekers staying in a refugee place in Staten Island, sharing the space with the people who had, you know, they were essentially child soldiers who had perpetrated these horrors upon them at the, of the war. And I thought, my God, what would I do if I was literally walking down the street if I came face to face with someone who destroyed my entire family, you know, it's the first thing you think is going to be revenge. But really, you just think it, it was just one of those dilemmas that just really threw me for a loop. And so we talked about it. And around that time, Tim had actually seen something that sort of like added to the yeah. idea. Um, I was at an intersection on 28th and 7th and yeah, 28th and 7th is like little Africa, a lot of street vendors, mm -hmm. wholesalers, a lot of African merchants. And I saw this mother dressed up in some very colorful uh, West African regalia. And she had a little daughter and the daughter was smiling at me. I waved and then I noticed her whole arm was lopped off. And I was thinking, what the hell? How, how does that happen? To a child. To a child. To a child, no less, yeah. And, and so it, it just had me thinking and then Maybe a couple of years later, um, my wife urged me to jump into a screenwriting class at Playwrights Horizon. I think it was primary stages. It was Prim primary, yeah, prim primary, it was primary stages. Yeah, primary yeah. stages. And one of our assignments was to write a short story, so or write, write a short script. And so I wrote the first draft of what you just saw. It was about nine or ten pages, and I said, "Oh, this is fun. I mean, this looks like a." something we could make at one, mm -hmm. one, one point. And I handed it to my wife and she, she had thought the same thing. And then we just put it away. And then we figured maybe we should outline this and make it a feature length. But then the years went by and, and we thought, you know. We, you know, you got caught up in life, you know, because I was doing a lot of, um, I was, in the meantime, I'd begun switching into acting. I was getting kind of like unchallenged and bored with dance. So I started getting more into acting and doing a lot of theater in New York and across the country, but go on. Sorry. Didn't oh, no, no. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, we had this, this uh, small draft and we were talking about, you know, maybe we should just make this into a film at some point. And it kind of went to file 13 for hmm. a couple of years. And then we initiated a, um, we we made a tape to do a crowdfunder and we we shot a scene from it. Um, yeah, kind of like a, a what do they call those things? A sizzle. A, a sizzle, like a sizzle reel, although yeah, basically. <laughs> and we shot in around Twenty Eighth Street, and then again, life came up. I started getting more shooting jobs, and you know, my wife started doing more work on stage, Broadway, and then she started doing more film acting. And then we, several years later, we caught a break. And she said, we're going to make this film yeah, this like, summer, no matter what. We're doing it this summer. <laughs> Thank God we did. <laughs> and so we got our good friend and producer, Jacques Aswari, on board. And 
she was kind of like our fixer. And I feel every film needs one of those, somebody who just can step away and give you the broad view of what needs to get done, gives you the punch list, kind of like um, our taskmaster, so to speak. Mm -hmm. she, she kept us on point and kept us on budget. <laughs> and that was good because I actually met Jack, uh, um, we were doing a play together. It was work. We would, we both end up in the same play at Classical Theatre of Harlem, and I forget what it was. I think it was Romeo and Juliet we were doing. And first of all, her name caught my eye because I'm from West Africa, and her name is Jaka Swaghe, which is a typical West African name. So I just thought, oh, she's from like my dad's people. Her people are my people, and. It's, Turns out she's from Guinea. Her dad's from Guinea, which is north of, basically north of Sierra Leone. Anyway, we became really good friends as a result of that because of our shared background. And when you fast forward years later, she'd made a short film of her own um, called Wakanda Forever. Jazz in Wakanda. I made a film called Wakanda Forever. She did a movie called Jazz in Wakanda before Wakanda Forever. Anywho. She did this movie short and Nikki asked me to be in it. And I thought, oh, this is great. I can return the favor. She could be in our film. And then I find out she's an amazing producer, which is God knows that's what we needed. Because it's like, oh, we found someone who's made a film before. This is going to be helpful because we've never made a film of our own. So we don't know where to start. And she knew she had. I mean, you had. I've made a few. You've made a film. For, I had never. It was my first time writing and directing. So. I left all of that to Tim because he has the technical expertise. Like in terms of like we went from the script. I know I can write, so I took over the script writing. We co-wrote and tweaked it and yeah. made it better. But in terms of like you came up with a shot list and stuff like that, right? Yeah, well, it happened. I, I handed the script over to my wife. And about a week later, she hands me back another draft. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it, it went from something that was very matter of fact very present time to flashbacks that are based on much of her childhood in Sierra, Le Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, this 10 page script became a, a 13, 14 page script that just had a lot more, I guess, specifics, more dimension. And so when we decided to set a date on when to do it, that's when we had to break the script down into a shot list and I've been working as a DP for almost two decades and my wife has been in front of the camera for quite some time. So we kind of both inform each other when it comes to doing shot lists. Mm -hmm. And the first approach I have when I do a shot list is I look at the scene and I just need to know what thematically and dramatically the scene is about. Um, you know, for instance, uh, I go to the dentist, the drama is to survive um thematically is utter panic <laughs> and so if, if, I, if i know what the emotional tone is and what the plot mechanics are then we can come up with a shot list that captures you know those things and i kind of work one of two ways i either write the shot down or i draw it out and coming from a fine art background i can probably draw faster than i can describe things and I think um, you have access to our, our storyboards. And those are, are just thumbnails that when we sit down in shot list, we draw it out. Um, yeah, as you can see right now, there's, you see the eyes. And it's pretty much like what we did. And I, I'm not a big fan of storyboarding everything because you need a little flexibility to do things, you know, to roll with it on set. If something better comes on set, you know, so the storyboards can be used more as a guide. Want to comment on that? No, 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 keep going. I mean, I really enjoyed, first of all, I really loved looking at the storyboards um, because they're just beautiful little port individual portraits for me anyway. And I, I w wouldn't even know where to begin in terms of visualizing because I learned, it was a learning process for me too because he's done this before and I haven't. So I actually found I learned a lot of the filmmaking process, storyboards, storyboarding being one of the most important things because, you know, I have the idea in my head of how the whole movie would run, but in terms of these individual shots that tell the story, the pieces that, are part, that become part of a whole, those were, it was a huge learning process for me because, uh, 
you know, thank you to Tim and Jacka uh, as a producer, mm -hmm. you know, was able to help us with that. And then in terms of... And Jacka gave us deadlines all along the way. She gave us deadlines, you know, in terms of how, you know, not just the storyboards, but in terms of budget. Yes. You know, what are we going to do with budget? How, how, how much is it going to cost? How are we going to raise the money? Who's going to give us the money to make this movie? We don't know because... Well, that, that's another thing in, in terms of budgeting creative process. Yes, that's what storyboarding helps too. Yes. In terms of storyboarding going. brings you somewhat into reality because what you draw, there's a price tag for every one of those pictures. Mm -hmm. And if I draw a wide shot with a cast of hundreds, well, maybe I could do it with a tighter lens and just stack people, maybe 20 people, and it looks like a crowd or feels like a crowd. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, your shot isn't meant to be a literal record. It's meant to impart a feeling. If I can impart the notion of feeling nervous or panic and do it for less, I'll, we'll find a way to draw it out. Um, what else can I say about storyboarding? It also keeps you, helps you to keep in mind that, like you said, the budget, Yes. The budget, you know, in terms of the spaces. I mean, if you, it's no good doing something, drawing something that takes place in an airport hangar if you can't afford it. You know, so how else would you be able to tell the story using a location that forwards the story without actually having to like? Yes, absolutely. And the good thing, about, what I like about storyboards, especially when they're specific, if, if, you, if you look at some of the storyboards, you'd see somebody with a camera and it takes place in a studio. Anyone looking at the storyboard, especially when you have scene numbers attached to it, from our assistant director to our production designer to our producer, they look at that storyboard and they say, oh, we're going to need a camera, a prop camera. We're going to need a tripod. We're going to need four extras in the background. And so they immediately begin, are able to break things down. So I feel that once you have the script and you're breaking it down to shots, I recommend getting that shot list done as soon as possible. You can always revise it later, but it helps get your budget on track. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it also, you know, for me, again, if you're a newbie to this filmmaking world as I was, and still relatively still new, um, just an idea of where cameras are placed, where to place the camera in terms of, you know, perspective, who's talking, who's listening. And those things, is, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just doesn't occur to you if you've never done it or been to film school. And I did not go to film school. Like I said, I've only ever been in front of a camera until this um, opportunity. So I was, I saw things from a different perspective and he, you know, and learning just camera placements and lenses and uh, all of that stuff was like huge, huge learning opportunity for me. And then we went into... And having a production team like Jacka and also Julie Surnan who came in, um, that helped because the next thing you do after you do all of that stuff, you get your team together, is that you plan the budget. Yes. The budget and... Well, our main team would be, you know, Jack is our producer, so she's in charge of the big picture and how we spend our money. As we're Julie Surnan, she's our unit production manager and she makes the deals. She mm -hmm. makes a lot of the specific deals on where do we rent vans? How much are we going to pay for this space? Because what was our original budget in the first place? We we had thought we were going to do it for. We were so green and just hopeful, hopeful newbies. But we thought we could do the film for something like, originally we thought we were going to do it for like eight, 18,000. Yeah, our original budget, um, we got a little slap w with reality because... Mm -hmm. That summer, the summer of 22, was probably one of the busiest summers in New York City for mm -hmm. film production. Um, there was a lot of backlog of work because things went dark for COVID. And then we had this window where, hey, we need all the production companies, all the streamers saying, we need to make product right away because mm -hmm. there's a bit of a lull in this pandemic. And it was mm -hmm. so hard to get crew locations and gear that summer and the people you could get were really expensive yes a lot of a yeah. lot of the usual people i hire were not available and we're doing a a low budget short film micro budget micro budget <laughs> we originally budgeted it for twenty seven thousand, and we raised it via crowdfunding which we'll talk about later and um we raised it pretty quickly uh, you'd be surprised um 
and it was a pretty flush summer. So people were, were partying with their checkbooks and, but they also, they liked the project. They knew that we believed in the project. And so we raised the funds, but the reality was that once we started to book people or try to book people that we, we had to raise our labor costs or we wouldn't be able to get people at a certain professional standard. Especially, exactly. I mean, you're looking at if you want good actors, you have to look at people at some point, are they in the union? And, you know, the, at some point they're going to be in the union and that costs money um, because you have to pay SAG. If they're part of SAG-AFTRA, that's going to determine, that's another dent in your budget. Yeah. That's something you have to keep in mind as well because that costs money in terms of the contract, in terms of... Um, not just the cast and the crew, but in terms of insurance, all of these things. So how did we do it? We decided to go into crowdfunding, right? Yes. And it was a company called Seed and Spark. Seed and Spark. You should write that down if you're looking to raise money for your film. Because unlike Indiegogo or Kickstarter, which does a whole slew of other, other types of crowdfunding, yeah, yeah. Seed and Spark specializes in film. And I, I find they're, they're one of the best. Um, and if you don't raise your, even if you don't reach your goal, you still get the money. Very important. Yeah, I think you have Very to important. make something like 80% of your goal to get mm -hmm. the money. Yeah. As opposed to Kickstarter, you have to make 100%. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it was, yeah. Yeah, it's a little less onerous than Kickstarter. And it's not so spread thin. Like, I find Indiegogo, they, they just got their hands on too many things. And also, you know, not to sling a little mud, but there's been a... There's a bit of a bit of scandal of scam crowdfunders that have gone through Indiegogo. So a lot of people I know are, are reticent to fund things through Indiegogo these days. Mm. But Seed and Spark, another thing I loved about them um, in terms of helping you raise the money for your film, they also guide you in how to build your campaign. Yes. Which is amazing. They, got, they, they send you these little videos. It's like a real, almost like a hand-holding on how to build your campaign, you know, your incentives that you offer to your, you know, potential donors. They don't even use the term donors. There's another word we use. Sponsors. With, not supporters. sponsors. But, but these people are like supporters and friends. But they really guide you. And what I loved about it at the end, it actually, when you look back at what you built, you find out, oh, my God, we just built a pitch deck. You literally just built yeah, a pitch deck when you look back at it. Seed and Spark, it, it guides you through in such a way. And the make you watch you have to sign in log in and watch their workshops before you can proceed any further and i guess it's a bit of risk management on their part but it's great risk management on your part mm -hmm. um I, I we learned so much about putting together a pitch deck and how to maximize social feeds for crowdfunding yeah and also it just really helps you just really keep nurturing that passion for the project you're working on because the more you get into it, you know, the more you want to, like they say in terms of what incentive you're going to um, offer to someone who at this price point. And then you start really thinking about it and you really, really, it, it's, it becomes more important and not so casual, not just a, oh, I want to make a film. All of a sudden it's like, oh, this is life and death. This is really important. And you you put your entire being into it. So that was fantastic. And in terms, and now that you've gotten that far and you've, bought this, you've built this amazing pitch deck and people were so supportive because, you know, when, once we started launching the campaign, the feedback was almost instantaneous. And we, we raised, we were trying to raise 18,000. We ended up raising 30. Yeah, we, we, we almost know, doubled our, two weeks. Our, our goal, mm -hmm. which was great because, the, the final budget ended up being closer to 40 grand. We went about 10 grand out of pocket, mm -hmm. but it's better than going 40 grand out of pocket. Yeah. But I think one of the best things about crowdfunding, especially something like Seed and Spark, it builds in a support base. Yes. Say if we just went out of our pocket, we don't have a lot of people who are invested to spread the word about our film. Exactly. And with um, doing any kind of crowdfunding campaign, but and especially in this case, Seed and Spark, you're, you're basically building an audience for your film. People who are invested in it, not just financially, but emotionally and intellectually, they're, they're learning about it, they're seeing, and they're really rooting for you to get to the next level and reach yeah. your goal. And then that's a built-in audience who's gonna spread the word and get their friends to come and, you know, because when we did a screening, it was like yes. amazing. It's like you're 
we you're growing your audience from the ground up, which is the best thing. We, we did our, our first screening for cast and crew, but also supporters at Dolby 88. And Dolby 88, in my estimation, is the best screening room in all of New York City. The sound is perfect, the pitch is perfect. And they saw the film and they liked it so much they gave us the space, which is fantastic because a space like that would have cost you know, at least a couple thousand and we were able to do a, a party there as well. Mm -hmm. But we filled the place, every, we, we filled every single seat. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't have crowdfunding, there might've been some empty seats. Yeah, because the thing about the crowdfunding that's also really smart, I'm sure everyone knows this, but it also encourages you to not just mine every contact you have, but also your social, your interwebs, you know, your Instagram and your Twitter, you know, like if you're not a big social media person, now is the time to get into being a social media person because it really helps build. We built a whole page for the film Reunion Short Movie on Instagram. It's like, is it called the Reunion Short Movie or reunionshortmovie.com at Reunion Short Movie? It's still up because we're still building a crowd with it. And those people spread the word and you can keep relentless postings, just endless. But, you know, it's all about building an audience, which is you want as many eyes on your on your film as possible, because that's who we're making it for. We're making it for the people out there. And so social media helps. And even we even got our actors in on it as well, because yes. they're going to get on their, you know, socials and spread it to their social so circles. before we start talking about casting, I just wanted to backtrack a little bit in terms of when the imposition of budget makes you come up with some creative solutions. <laughs> if you look at our storyboards, you'll see pictures of the flashbacks of the little kids lo looking out at the bay, watching the boats come in, mm -hmm. and or or when they're, the man is walking through town with the body over his back. We originally had thought of going to Sierra Leone, casting and shooting it in Freetown. I, I don't know what we we're thinking. It would have been nice. It's had... good to have the fantasy and the desire. You know, it's like, I believe when you're writing, just go as far as your fantasy will allow you to and get it down on paper. And then, you know, you, when you start think, thinking of budgeting, then you can like, you know, you can still have the same feeling, but maybe a lot more cost conscious way. So, well, after we got a little whiff of reality, <laughs> Um, then we 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 gauge our sights on perhaps shooting in Westchester. Yeah, we thought upstate would be really cool. We're like, can we make they have West, trees upstate? We can make upstate. upstate look like Africa, right? I mean, yeah, we just find some yeah, trees. Some a tree is a tree. Trees and mango trees just a rock is around. a rock. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, look at that oak tree. Let's pretend it's a mango tree. No. But then we came to our senses, and <laughs> those illustrations that you see. Uh, we originally did an early Kickstarter that we never quite got off the ground a few years before. We didn't quite launch it. We talked about yeah, it. Yeah, we got very close to launching it, and then life got in the way. But we got this animator named Vincent Spencer. No, he's an mm. illustrator to draw these animation or these the storyboards. These and these storyboards that we or these real fine storyboards, so we could raise money. Now, Vince is not just your average illustrator. He did the storyboards for The Departed. He does some big graphic novel work um, for Marvel and whatnot. So he's, he's not just your average storyboard artist. And so he put to get together these really fine rotoscoped illustrations for us. And then I said to my wife, what do you think of the idea of just doing all the flashbacks with Vincent's illustrations? We thought about it. We looked at the budget of going to Sierra Leone. <laughs> and the reality of going to Sierra Leone. And then Leone, we also realized that we mentioned it to our we producer. Because we probably might not be able to get the crew that we needed. You yes. know what I mean? I mean, this is a country that's like 15 years outside of a civil war. I mean, who... And just getting out of Ebola. Yeah. And uh, the Ebola being knocked twice or three times was the Ebola. So there was the possibility of there's a definite potential of not getting the crew we needed. Yeah, you know, so amongst other things. So we thought, yeah, how about that? Getting was a, through customs. <laughs> that was a brilliant idea. If, if your equipment even makes it through customs, but that was a brilliant idea that Tim came up with in terms of how about we make the flashback sequences. And so we looked at some examples, and one of the examples that came to mind was Kill Bill. Kill Bill does wonderful stuff with graphic mm -hmm. novel inserts, 
And they did really well. So, they, hey, we figured if they can do it on Kill Bill, we can do it on our short mm -hmm. film. And we mentioned it to Jack, our producer, and she thought it was a much better idea. I'm not sure if that was budgetary or creatively driven, but <laughs> she pushed us in that direction. And in the end, we feel that was a better option than e if we even had the choice to go to Sierra Leone. Yeah. And actually, in, for me personally, in terms of storytelling, I, th I thought it made that section of the film much more poignant and actually much more real, just because it's told from a point of memory, from a childhood memory. And I thought if, in fact, if we had actually gone and shot live action of that, it would have been a little too on the nose. You know, I like that it was a graphic novel um, depiction because it made it much more of a abstract memory. You know, because it yeah. was such it was such a the, the moment it depicts was such a weird. I mean, that, those scenes you see actually that's literally from my childhood memory, and so. It's, but it's almost like when you think back and like, did this happen? Did I, did I imagine that? It's almost like it was so far away. And I thought it made it a much stronger um, storytelling choice when it became the graphic novel, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And I find when it's with the illustrations, it's a bit more of an abstraction. So it lets the audience fill in the blanks, fill in the, the blanks of movement and, and reaction. Uh, that's kind of, I guess, in the way a comic book works. Mm -hmm. And so in that regard, I felt it was a better choice. And so what about the casting? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So what, when it comes to casting, I had to defer to my wife because... You can call me Z. I can, they, yeah. know, I, they, I know, to, I, they know I'm your wife at this point. Okay. You know what I mean? It's not like you just found one in the, the hallway. My wife. What's your name again? <laughs> but I, I had to defer to my... I had to defer to Zainab. He doesn't call me that. He calls me Z. I'd refer to Z. <laughs> uh, because she knows so many actors in New York. Mm -hmm. Having been on stage, having been in front of a camera. Uh, we didn't actually have to audition anybody. Nope. We nope. just had to call people and find out if they're available. And, you know, auditioning is just a whole other process unto itself. And not having to do that was such a relief. I also think when you're writing with an actor in mind, it makes it actually fuels the writing. It kind of makes it a little easier. So I started thinking about cast when we started doing thinking about who would be play um, Aisata in this you know, and who would play uh, Mamadou. And the minute I started thinking about who the actors would be, it actually helped with the rewrites. It actually tightened the writing because yeah. I started thinking of there were two people I had in mind for Aisata. They both are equal. I'd been on stage with both of them. Oddly enough, they're both Ghanaian. They're both called, well, one's Maya, the other one's Mamea, which is the full version of Maya. Maya Boateng ended up being the one we chose to, to play Aisata. I could just see it. I could see her and it just wrote itself after that. And so I'd done a play with, I had done Midsummer Night's Dream, again, Classical Theatre of Harlem, with Maya. And she, she was on her way to NYU Tisch for grad acting school. And I just thought, she would be perfect for Aisata. She's the right age. And I basically just called her. I said, can I send you this script? Would you be interested? And she called me back immediately, very emotional, saying, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> and I said, would you, be, would you be up for it? And she said, absolutely, absolutely. And same with, um, with, with Ma Mamadou, the Mamadou character. I had a few, over the years as we were writing, you know, Quite a few people came up, but they never really worked out. And every time we did a new rewrite, you know, they it ended up being they're not either available or they no longer write for it. But end up we end up going with this actor called Obi Abili, who I again I've done a workshop with him, and I thought he's he grew, he went to school in London, drama school in London, and I'd read great reviews about him. I didn't know him personally, but I'd read great reviews about him. I did a workshop with him, and then I just thought, oh, he'd be perfect for it. He's the right age, so. When those all those um, elements come together, it makes magic because you know she was the right age and everything. And then stage actors, I are just people who just we have a shorthand because I have a stage background. There was a shorthand there, so it helps me as an as a director communicate with them 
you know, as a new director, I was able to communicate with them with a language that I was familiar with and they were familiar with, so that helped. And also with the same with the same with the little girl who played Jennifer, I met her on a short film. <laughs> Amazing, she's six years old. She's working more than most of us. She was seven at the time, but she we'd done a short film that's actually running in um, at the Metropolitan Museum yeah. still. Um, I can't remember. It was a short film by Jen Ikuru. It's a, some kind of experimental art film. Uh, something, something we could fly. Anyway, I'll, I'll think about it and tell you. But anyway, that's how I met my actors from just from experience from working with them, which helps so much. Oh, and you then know. we also cast uh, Katie Irby. She used to be on Law and Order. As, and Law and Order. C S Special Intent. Yes, yeah, special. Oh no, no. Uh, Criminal <laughs> Intent. I'm making this. Criminal Intent. Special Dickens. No, that's SVU. I, I Criminal Intent. Criminal Intent. Yes, yes. And I, I'd worked on a film with, with uh, Katie several years ago, and we kept in touch. And I sent her the script, and she said, "Yes, I'm in." Just yes. like that. And as the people, if the talent liked the script, they're just way more likely to do it. And we were on what's called a SAG micro budget contract, which means you pay them a nominal fee. So they really have to like it and like you. Yeah, and also your first point of contact when you're making a low budget film is, you know, the people immediately around you in your immediate circle, people you know, and people who you hopefully have worked with, or at the very least like you or like your ideas and you've had conversations. That's your first point of contact, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. if they happen to be huge stars, that's even better, but they don't have to be. Yeah. But one of the tips I could add, though, when it comes to casting in New York, the great thing about New York is you have such a vibrant theater scene happening. And that's the best way to see lots of actors and just very quickly gauge and be entertained is to watch them on stage. Mm -hmm. And it's no coincidence that all of our principals are seasoned stage actors from New York. Yeah. Those in fact, I can't think of a, a single principal actor that we had that wasn't even the even the not principal actors the smaller roles like Stacy Sargent who played the lady in the restaurant I've done <laughs> I've done play, lots of plays with her she's an amazing actress she's just on Broadway for Colored Girls she was in she just finished doing Colored Girls she actually she was on Broadway at the time doing Colored Girls um uh the second iteration of that and she's absolutely spectacular and who else even Patrick Sanjovo Patrick Sanjovo who played the news papers vendor another person shared a stage with him done workshops with him so uh, i love new york stage actors what can i mean just stage actors in general there's a certain vers versatility and ahmed jallo ahmed with jallo him. who played the guy at the um on the platform worked with him as well Ahmad. so there's a versatility and um a professionalism and an immediacy to their what they can bring to your work which is so helpful when you're doing a low budget thing you don't want to have to be there for days and days and days trying to squeeze and eke out a performance from someone who may not know how to do it you know what i mean and then one of the interesting things when we shot at m n on the other side of town for the tv studio with uh Catherine irby and obi I had no idea that they already knew each other. That's they're, so funny. Yeah, they're, they're talking to each other and they're looking at each other and they say, wait a minute. And it turns out they had done a play together. Seriously? Yeah. I forgot that. That's amazing. Small So they both knew small. each other's work. Yeah, there you go. So that, that helps for everyone to like just be relaxed and open to doing the work and bringing it. You know. The, I mean? the other thing I liked about working with stage actors, especially in, in that scene, is they just came in knowing their lines cold. They didn't need a teleprompter. They didn't need cue cards. And I've worked on a lot of TV shows where you have some seasoned TV actors and right outside a camera mm -hmm. is a PA holding a cue card. Yes. And I'm looking at them, it's like, I get paid to do my job. Could you at least memorize the lines? Yeah, well, it's <laughs> difficult if you're in a situation where they're giving you new rewrites 10 minutes before you walk on set. Okay. That's happened to me where literally they give you a whole new script and you're like, uh, I just spent days learning this, so yeah, you okay. have to be able to be I'll flexible. Give a little lie. Okay, so we talk about location now. Yes, actually, the thing that was harder than finding professional crew at a reasonable price was finding locations, because it's New York City, and 
you know, if we're shooting in a small town, finding a warehouse location or an apartment, not a big deal. But in New York City, finding locations, that was tougher than finding actors. And I love actors, but locations is just, it's just murder. And so we had all hands on deck to find locations. And one of the first locations that we really needed was the apartment. Mm -hmm. And Airbnb came to the rescue. Mm -hmm. We found a, a nice Airbnb in the Bronx and had an... How did we find that Airbnb again? Was Jacques it... found it. Because there, there's a website you can go to, right? That gives you the... Yes, there's another, it's called... Um, there's some boy. kind of website. There's another website that... You... Something, Peerspace. 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 That's Amazing. great for just looking for uh, locations to shoot in. And mm -hmm. they're often way more reasonable than what you think. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of the restaurants. Okay, yeah, the, the restaurant, that, that was a tough one to get. We walked really around... Tough. Um, Burnside area of the Bronx. Why and did we, we want it to be in the Bronx? I know we wanted. Well, you we really be... wanted to shoot in an African restaurant at. Uh, we wanted to be in Burnside. an African community yes. and an African restaurant. But know. the African restaurants were they, they didn't want to film shoot. They did. They were very like no. They were not. Also, they didn't want cameras. They basically. didn't want cameras. <laughs> I don't know what they were hiding. Shade. Anyway. <laughs> Amazing restaurant. But the Dominican restaurant opened well, we their doors were like, to us. We, the first place we went to this African restaurant, we really wanted to shoot there just because it's just the community that Isata would be living in. And the food is great. But the, and the food is amazing. But we got there and we realized this is not going to work. First of all, they no longer have the seating area that they used to have. Yeah. And it's now just a takeout place. And I just felt like it, there was no way we could put cameras or anything. Stage crew gear. And so we were so a little bit despondent. So we decided to... As we were leaving, walking around the neighborhood, there's this Dominican restaurant across the street. What was it called? El Viejo. El Viejo. El Vie we have it written down here. The Jobo El Viejo, El Viejo seafood, seafood Restaurant. Yes. So we went there to go and like regroup and think what we're going to do next. And I was like, and I suddenly thought, this place could be perfect. We are getting actually, our gizzards. Yes. But it was actually really, we just went, actually, this works. And then we asked, you never know until you ask. We asked the lady. Yes. You know, called the waitress and we asked her, would the owner mind? And Balky. Was Balky. And what happened? She said yes immediately. Yes. Like, no, she, she didn't even pause or hesitate. She just went, yeah, she'd love it. She'd love it. And so. And we, we, we worked out a deal where we'd bring the cast and crew, we, we'd have breakfast there, and we'd put them on the credits. And she, she asked for a nominal fee. She, and we mm -hmm. insisted on giving her more because it was such a find. Yeah. Uh, what else about the location? It was much bigger than what we actually shoot. And that's the thing I can say about any location. If you want to shoot a, a scene in a kitchen, well, you need at least three times the space of a kitchen because mm -hmm. you need space to put your hair, makeup, and wardrobe. You need space to put your gear that you're not actually using. And then you need space to shoot. And that's generally my rule of thumb when shooting on location is at least three times bigger than what you plan to show. And they were really kind at this restaurant. They gave us literally a holding. They gave us holding so we can go and shoot the platform scenes outside and the rest of the crew and cast that are not needed, they let them stay there for and no we, additional we, fee. And when we needed them, we just hit them up on the walkie and they'd walk out to the subway. Yeah, it was really lovely. It was an amazing find. They were really, you need to go to this place. El Viejo Jobo or something. Best egg sandwiches. On Burnside best Avenue. Egg sandwiches they were ever. absolutely amazing. <laughs> and what what else okay so yeah we had to get a tv studio and was it jacka who turned us on to mnn mm -hmm. and we got the tour and as soon as i walked in the studio i thought this is perfect this looks it was basically a, a tv studio which uh, up till then we hadn't thought that was one of the things we were actually nervous about in terms of how are we going to do this how are we going to find yes. how are we going to set up a studio a place to look like a TV studio, and then Jack had found out about M and N. We came and saw, and we thought, "Oh, it's literally that. It's just a walk-in and shoot situation. Yeah, we don't have to bring in anything except for maybe flowers. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was all there. <laughs> it was all there, and they had more than enough room for holding. It, it was actually a luxurious day for us. Mm -hmm. and, and what was the other location? That the was... bookstore. Ah, Asian American, right? See, that's the thing. If you really think, when you're making a movie, you really have to think about everyone and anyone you may have ever met 
in your or done anything with in this city because they're all going to be your most valuable resources. So when we're thinking of the bookstore, originally it was written, the reading was supposed to take place in like a Barnes and Noble type situation. And then we thought, okay, uh, we're going to write down the fantasy, but the reality is, I don't know if we're going to be able to like <laughs> shoot in a Barnes and Noble. And then I thought maybe a, a mom and dad, mom, like and, a, pop, a mom and pop bookstore, some old, somewhere some in Park Slope where we live, or West Village kind of bookstore. You know, and that didn't work. And then one day I just remembered I had gone to a friend's reading. Uh, she's a journalist and she was working on a, a novel and she'd invited me to a reading in Midtown and it was at the Asian American Writers Workshop. And this was like, it was, it was just after the pandemic or was it still in, in it was just after, was, but nobody had really gone back to work. Yeah, so they, they, were, they weren't open yet. They weren't open yet. They weren't so open for business. basically this entire space empty and it, it was lined, well, with, by books. lined with books is a writer's workshop which is the perfect place for a writer to read excerpts of their work just like what we'd seen in uh, in the script so i went there and i thought we'd be able to get it for a really good deal too because not only is it a bookstore ready to go it's called asian american writers workshop we may get it for a deal because guess what Tim's half Asian. Oh my God! <laughs> yes, I don't think that helps. She li listen. The woman was Filipina. She literally gave you that look of like, mm hmm. I see you, brother. I'm like, yep, yep. Nah. Use your connections. Yep. Anyway, so that was a great find. Yes, it was. And what about the school? Oh, okay. So, so we wanted this idealized version of a school or a, mm -hmm. a school building, and so. I looked at so many different school fronts in the Bronx, in Upper Manhattan, and I have no idea how we came upon it. I think Jaka found it. What, the school? Huh. But it's not really a school. It's, I found it. It's condos in an art center. It was a converted school. Yes. It's, yeah, it, it used to be a school, the LaGuardia. Um, oh, gosh, I wish you remember the name of it. LaGuardia it's up in something. It's up in East Harlem. Um, and it's now fancy condos, but back in the 30s and 40s, it was a school in this very Latino community. And so it was perfect because it had this huge, you know, um, front. Yeah. The grounds were great. The classic 1930s. Again, we got it for free. They didn't charge us anything no, to just all. shoot in front of it. It's amazing. You never know until you ask. That's what I say. Always just never be afraid to ask. As my grandmother used to say, grandmother was very, very religious. She had a children's theater company called Christ's Little Band. That's where I got my start. <laughs> anyway, as grandma would say, ask and ye shall receive. So we asked. Yeah, and we received. And we received for free. We could shoot on the grounds. You know, it's like come in early in the morning when there are not many people, you know, all the deliver after before the deliveries and all that. And it was like perfect. So, I mean, the long and short locations, it's good to have more than one person working on it. Yeah. Because if, if we just had one person trying to nail these locations, they might have just gotten them by now. And locations are so difficult, you know, because, you know, you don't want to be too far from, you know, you don't want your, your small, low budget camera crew and actor unit traversing the city from Staten Island to the Bronx to Brooklyn to Queens. You know, ideally it would be, it's, it, it works. Ideally, you want to be as close to each other as possible to minimize travel time. Yes, yes. You know, you want to minimize travel time. Like, where was the Airbnb? Place? Airbnb was in the Bronx. Exactly. It was, it was maybe about was... a mile from our restaurant location. Mm -hmm. And just a little note about the, the Airbnb location. If you look at the very first scene and then the very last scene, they're both in the apartment. But our production designer mm -hmm. came up with this idea that it's going to start off all warm and, and gentle yellow tones, real comfort tones. And then in the last scene, it's going to look a little more, I guess, uh, that bleak. Bleak is the word. Uh, more desaturated and not so colorful. And so we needed a location where we'd shoot the opening scene where everything's nice and comfortable and she has all these different types of yellow tones. And then we'd shoot another part of the apartment and then she'd redress the first part. And so we could come back to it. 
So we needed enough space to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And instead of having to get two different locations for it, mm -hmm. I think we, we shot the front room mm -hmm. when she's in the apartment with her daughter. Then we went to the bathroom. We shot that out. And then we shot the kitchen scene out when she arrives in from jogging. And by the time we're done with that, she had all ready for the last scene. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so scheduling and location, they work hand in hand like that. Exactly. But still, they, you know, no matter how well prepared or how well planned you are, you're going to face some unexpected hurdles. You know, like there's things you're going to find that you you didn't plan for, but you certainly, especially we're living in a time, especially at that time, you coming on the tail end of the pandemic, suddenly you had to have a COVID inspector oh, on God, set no. for everything. So there, people had to be tested on a daily basis. And that's another, you know, expense we never thought about. So basically you could go and I had to go and learn to be a COVID officer because, you know, I had to go and take a test to qualify so I can be there in the mornings testing people, swabbing people before. And it's not just the... And even then, thank God I did that because our first day of shoot, our COVID lady... Or COVID, COVID PA didn't had show. COVID, yes, and the other one didn't show up. <laughs> yeah, so that was um, one of the unexpected hurdles. I mean, there's certain things like the, the prosthetic arm. You know, write oh your fantasy. Where Try, are you trying to, to a find a prosthetic arm. A prosthetic. Your average prosthetic arm costs thousands and thousands of dollars. Which and I wrote about. to different companies and. They don't want to let them go unless it's coming through medical insurance. Mm -hmm. So I went to eBay to see if I could just hunt down a prosthetic arm. And even your used prosthetic arm from the 50s is also <laughs> going for a lot of money. And then I just came across this one little thing on eBay of just the front of the arm. And somebody's selling it for a couple hundred bucks. And I just hit click because that was going to go in a second yeah because we we had one did we get a, a prototype of a prosthetic arm that just looked really strange yes well we... yes <laughs> i'm like okay this is turning into a comedy this is not what we intend it's going to be unintendedly unintentionally funny and so we had that prosthetic arm situation it was so difficult because how do you work it with a sleeve it's going to look like this extremely long arm because the actor does have an arm it's yes. not like he's missing an arm so how do you add a prosthetic arm to an arm that's there it's not like you can just remove it and then you have this big fat arm. it was really interesting and you know this labor costs you know crew costs available cr crew and all of those things you know you have to plan for it was a learning experience learning experience right absolutely absolutely and so what else oh, there's something else that? i wanted to talk about locations you know if you're doing if you're shooting in new york and you're doing a New York story, at some point you're going to have the urge to want to shoot in the subway or mm -hmm. some place owned by MTA. <laughs> and if you want to shoot in the subway, you have to have minimally, I think, a $3 million liability pol umbrella policy, amongst other things. And then you have to go through a lot of red tape and bureaucratic approval. Mm -hmm. Or you can just steal it, but then you run the risk of getting arrested. And the the city's law is pretty much worded in so many ways, but it boils down to the moment you put down a tripod, uh, they'll reprimand you. Mm -hmm. And so we had to think, what can we do? And so- you Handheld everything. We could do a handheld, but it might look too shaky. So we, we ended up doing it on a little handheld gimbal. Ooh, and that cool. made it look like it's tripod steady, but uh, without having to lay down a tripod. And there were police on the platform. They're just looking at us like we're having a good shoot. But there were times when there, some of them were kind enough to just look the other way. But the moment you lay down a tripod, mm -hmm. they come out in full force. They come out in full force. But there were there were some who just decided, I'm just going to be on my, t I'm just going to be checking Instagram right now. Y'all carry on, hurry up, do it Did, quick, didn't quick. Didn't see quick. it, didn't see it. Didn't see it. I don't see you gone. And we had to actually, we had an incentive to move fast too, just because it was roasting hot out on that platform. It's in the unsheltered, uncovered part of the Burnside Avenue. Yes. Lord Jesus, heat stroke. Burnside, it lives up the We lane. were burning on the side of, of that. Of the oh, and then there's another location that took a little while to find. 
were the steps in the Bronx. <gasps> and one thing I really love about the Bronx is the Bronx, is, a lot of it is very like bi-level. You have down and low, and then you have the buildings up high and they're connected by, I think there's something like 50 sets of steps in the Bronx connecting the low end to the high end. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to avoid using the Joker steps because the Joker steps have been used once very famously. And also it's loaded with tourists anyway. Tourists you're especially. never gonna get that space, uh, you know. You'll never get it empty. You never get it empty. It's gonna be because it's just famous now. So we wanted to find <laughs> some beautiful, epic Bronx steps. And so first thing I went on Google Maps to find stuff and type in Google searches. And it just took us forever to find the, the right steps. And eventually we did. It, it took a while. It was somewhere off Jerome Avenue. It was so worth it. Yes. They're beautiful. They were so beautiful. I mean, they're exhausting your, for your camera crew and your actors because those things are steep. You know, yes. they're great for they're a great workout, but on a hot summer day with cast and crew and equipment, ooh, that was um I mean it was worth it because they look beautiful, they're epic. And they're then epic, they're gorgeous. The location when she walks up to her apartment building. You know, when I saw that building, I was thinking, that's perfect. That looks exactly like where she should live. But also I know that's a, a big apartment building that's gonna take a lot of red tape going through the landlord. And one day we just turn the camera around and say, just walk into that building and shot and left. Yes. <laughs> sometimes you sometimes you just have to do that thing where you just bite the bullet and it took us about two minutes to see. And shoot. just say, <laughs> just do it. Just like it's it's it doesn't have to be complicated. Just like really simple. Just walk up the step. Just walk towards that building. Yeah. And then people were like, okay, just walk. And it's really interesting. Even the scene on the train. We shot on the train yes, at one point. On the on the was it the D train? or the four or five, they were actually really people on the train. This city is great to shoot in. People are so accommodating and everyone wants to be on camera. Everyone wants to be a star. And we what we decided spur of the moment, let's shoot this scene where she's like on the train back from the, um, from the. Well, on her way to Manhattan. On her way to Manhattan from the restaurant after she saw the TV show of the guy. And we just did it on the spur of the moment and everyone was like, oh, sure, go ahead. They just moved out of the way and they were like, hey, you know, move, guys, they're making a movie. Give them a space, give them a space. They were really lovely. Actually, New York, compared to other towns, people are pretty inert to cameras. Yes. You they can, you can to... plant a camera in Midtown and the only people who are going to look into your camera are going to be tourists. Yes. Yeah, exactly. New Yorkers are just it's kind of like, <laughs> this whole city is a star, therefore I am a star. And so, of course, there's a camera on me. I'm so used to it. It's an everyday occurrence, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that was fun. I, I mean, it was a lot of fun. That one was really funny because we decided at the spur of the moment to shoot on the actual train. And so we waited for the next train that was coming from Yankee Stadium. And this was a Sunday. So we're like, yeah, there should be one coming out. And of course, wouldn't you know, the one time you decide I'm going to do this on the train, the train decides it's not coming unless it's full of They people. rerouted them because of a Yankees game. Yeah, they wanted... <laughs> so we were standing there for like half an hour going... Nothing's coming. Where's the train? It's it's roasting hot. We just want one shot. You know, we, it's just a spur of the moment thing. Where is it now? But we got it anyway. And we just did it the one time. One take. Literally one take. And speaking of trains, we have an opening shot where you see two trains converging mm. and the credits come up. And... Yeah, you did that in post, well, right? Well, to get two trains converging like that, you might wait all week to get it just like that. And so we we shot it twice, and then we did a composite in post, a fairly simple composite. But um, that's the kind of thing you have to think about. Like, you know, what can I do in post that I can't do on set? Yes. And uh, what else? Do, what other shots do we futz around in post? Well, when, when she has the the stop motion traffic behind her. Mm -hmm. We actually shot that at the school, but we put a green screen behind her. And then we went up to, oh, I forget where in the Bronx. We were in the Bronx and we just shot traffic stop motion, which makes it look it's like- Concourse, a, right? The Grand Concourse, was it there? I think so. Yeah. And you know, we shot some, some footage where just in stop motion where you're shooting at a very, slow frame rate so when you speed it up it looks like the, the traffic is just blurring by mm -hmm. and um then we just composited that onto the green screen mm -hmm. 
and the key to getting a, a good green screen is that um you know you shoot it at the highest resolution you possibly can so you mm -hmm. can pull off a clean we call a clean key and at, at a decent exposure i mean it's a lot easier to do green screen than it used to be so exactly that. and also you know it also an, another learning thing for me is the fact that you know so once you've done the sh once you've shot everything the 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 storytelling how you're shaping the story and carving it and sculpting it still continues which is what you do in post you know to further tell the story like for instance the sound design the sound design was so important in fact it without the sound it's an incomplete film because every single thing you hear was specifically chosen from the the sound of frogs or crickets or you know you know every single thing the gunshots in the background in the distance everything was really considered and it's like another element of the storytelling and a very important element of the storytelling well, the sound design it was kind of a two-step process you know after we do the edit and we edit the dialogue um that's usually when i, I begin to lay in uh, the sound design mm -hmm. and the sound design would be divided up into ambient sound foley effects and music so to speak uh -huh. music and finding the foley effects meaning like footsteps or uh, crickets in the background i mean you can go out and record those yourself but that takes a lot of time and or you can go to a, one of the many sound libraries you can find out find online and the one that we use is called pond five Pond5 is an amazing resource. They have thousands and thousands of different samples. If you just look up footsteps on a hardwood floor, you're going to get it's amazing. a couple hundred offerings. It's an amazing. And they'll amazing. charge you like five bucks in effect, which means oh having to God. go outside and get it yourself. So much. Because like even the music, certain music that we wanted to use, we couldn't, you know, if you can't afford the rights, because the music rights are so expensive. Yes. You know, and if you're a low budget production, you can't you basically you cannot afford to reach reach to Arist, arista records or whichever big record company it is they're going to charge you 10 times the entire budget of your movie and for like a small excerpt if you of don't their own music. the rights to your music mm -hmm. no one's going to show it anywhere um right yes. now our, our film is showing on american airlines in flight what the in flight entertainment mm -hmm. and if we didn't own the rights to any of the, the soundtracks it would be grounded <laughs> yeah it wouldn't be so that's something you have to think about so we had to if you can find what is it called pond light pond, pond well pond five but we use primarily for effects but we also use it for what they call you can get music diegetic music meaning just or licensed free music and or you can buy it for like 10 15 dollars i think we got the when she goes up the stairs there's kind of this classical piece that we got from pond five and then we wanted one of our placeholder tracks was uh, not Ricky Martin, um, J Lo's old former husband with the Roman name. Oh, Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony. The yeah. Roman name. That's so true. Well, we we, like had, we had a Mark Anthony track as the placeholder, mm -hmm. and it would have been great to use it, but there's no way we're going to get it for mm -hmm. less than twice our budget. Our house, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Our house. <laughs> and so we went to this um what's it called another uh it's a licensed stream music amazing uh, site called uh something oh god you know it's it's escaping my mind right now but there's a bunch of them out there like and we were like we want something that sounds kind of like salsa premium da, 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 da. something like that I think something like premium beat and i typed in uh salsa track in the style of Mark Anthony. Exactly. And I got a few <laughs> offerings and we found something that works. Yeah. And it cost us like, what, $20? Um, that one cost us maybe 40 And uh, <laughs> And then the original tracks that we had, where we actually got licenses from musicians, uh, were in the beginning when she's dancing with her daughter and then that's also the same as the closing credit tracks mm -hmm. and we got it from this producer named jules he's a ghanaian producer 
He's based in London. Working out yeah. in London. And we wrote to him. It took us forever to get in touch with him, but Jacka finally tracked him down. And we worked out a licensing agreement with him. But we worked out a license uh, agreement in perpetuity in all forms. Mm -hmm. and yeah, you have to be very specific. We had to pay about two grand for that, which yeah. is not so bad. Yeah, he could have charged us a whole lot more and he very kindly, um, you know, gave us a deal, you know, because it was for good purpose. We saw, we sent, I think we sent him a clip of the film yes, or something. Exactly. Just appealed to him. He's a West African too. And also he's Ghanaian, like our lead actor. And he's so a that, pretty big Afrobeats things, producer. He's a huge Afrobeats producer and performer. And so he, he, you know, I mean, he could have charged whatever he wanted, yeah. but he was nice to us. Yeah. And so grateful. that's how we got the whole thing together. And now, since then, oh, wait, we've been... talk about Jim Reeves' track. Oh my gosh, there was this Jim Reeves track. Which Tell me who Jim really Reeves, Reeves is first. Jim Reeves is like this. He's a country singer from the fifties and sixties. And I, like I said, I grew up in West Africa in Sierra Leone, which is a former British colony. I was I was raised in the town of the colonizers who are all over West Africa, East Africa, India, and, and they Caribbean, love country music. Caribbean. And for some strange reason, they really love Jim Reeves. You know, he sang a song called "Welcome to My World," and they, that was the soundtrack of my childhood. Anytime you go and visit a grandma or a great grandma or grandpa, and it's the same in the Caribbean, somebody somewhere is playing Jim Reeves, and it's just the weirdest thing. It's this southern white country singer from the 50s and his stuff is huge all over the caribbean and, and africa and we really really wanted that but it was um it's post colonial crooner it's post colonial crooner and we really really tried to get it we tried so hard we really i really we, wanted we couldn't it. get the licensing rights down and then to something you know at, at one point i thought we can't make this movie without that sound it's like the sound of my childhood and you know this is very important this character so I learned another lesson there. I learned compromise. Let, let go. <laughs> I, had, I learned compromise and let go and say it's not the be all and end all. It will not kill the film. If so I, I went on a deep else. dive and I found and then this. I, I was just I was looking up um, just tracks for a certain style of African music. First, we were, I was thinking maybe we can use an old high life track that was big back in the day. And then that led me down some other rabbit hole, and I found this track called Senegalese Guitar Player. And I thought, wow, this sounds wonderful, <laughs> like the sound of the desert from Senegal. And I looked up the writer and musician, and he's a guy who performs in weddings, a white guy who performs in weddings. He's a Scottish and, and, guy, and, right? No, no, his name is Rick Smith. He's, he's out of the UK. He might be Scottish, but he primarily does events and weddings in the UK. <laughs> and he composed this track. In and, the style of... Uh, and, and I'm not even sure he's ever been to Senegal, but it's, it, when, you, when you listen to the track, it transports you. Yeah. And so I got in touch with him, and he's the nicest guy. He goes, oh, I really love your film. I love the track. But um, unfortunately, it's under a licensing company, so you're going to have to go through them. Otherwise, I'd just give it to you. And so I go to the licensing company, and they charge me $200. Wow. In perpetuity. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's not, it's one of those things where you have to learn them. You have to learn to compromise, the art of compromise where, okay, this is an incidental moment. It's a very important moment, you know. And so how can we compromise while still being authentic and being true to what we're trying to say in this particular moment? You know what I mean? And Well, it's interesting because Jaka, who's not from your generation, she actually related more to the Senegalese guitar mm -hmm. than the Jim Reeves. Yes. Because you're saying she's younger than me. Is that what you're saying? No, she didn't grow up in a British colony. Uh, oh, yes. She grew up in a French colony. <laughs> yes. They, Jim Reeves in French yes. doesn't sound the same. I know. It just doesn't sound the same. Say, it, just didn't try, it just didn't land with her. She just, she's like, I don't understand. I'm like, ah. Oh. See, that makes sense. She did, she she grew up in Paris. It'd be like you know, she grew up in Paris. Or, or I grew up in yeah, <laughs> sexy songs. But um, so that's how we made the film, and now we're doing the festival circuit, aren't we? Yes, we're kind of on the tail end of it now. Um, we have probably a few more festivals coming up, and it's on American Airlines, which is we're just so excited yes. about because yeah. probably more people will see it on American. And it's going to be there till the end of July. Is it July? End of July. Yeah. End of July. So anytime you make sure you only ever fly on American Airlines and make with sure you headphones. watch the movie with good headphones, even though it's a tiny screen, it's not. 
it's not optimum, but you know, it's not where I would ideally want it to be seen, but it's been seen by a lot of people, which is a great, yeah, great, you know, great I, I will compromise eyeballs for quality. Yes. Because I believe on America, more people will see it on American Airlines than all of the film festivals combined. Yes. And we've been to a few festivals. We did the ABFF in Miami. We've done dances with films in Los in Angeles, Los Angeles, uh, urban world in New York, which was such a fun great urban world. Film. All three of those festivals were excellent. Yes. Great fun. Lots of contacts and they take care of you. They take care of the, of the, the filmmakers. And also, it's been fun trying to. We've been we got into a few Oscar qualifying ones too. Yes, actually, all of the, all of the festivals we've been in were Oscar qualifying. But to actually qualify for an Oscar, you have to win one of those festivals. And so we won uh, Real Sisters back in October. And so our film it just missed the deadline for Oscars twenty four, but it, it'll now be qualified for Oscars twenty five. So, if you know someone who is an Academy member, send them our way. We'll send them a screener before 2025. Hmm. Okay. I think I know a few people. Somebody just popped into my head. You Good. Know, I think it's time for a Q&A. It says, talk about any challenges you experience producing a project with a partner. Oddly enough, I did not experience... Um, challenges you know it's really interesting i didn't even think about it until people started remarking on how well tim and i worked together because i remember i kept thinking wait usually when we at home when he has to shoot me put me on tape for auditions i'm i'm such a horrible person i'm i'm just not easy i'll say he'll say can you move to the left and i'll say how about you move the camera i've chosen to stand here this is where i want to be but with with shooting this, I think it's, we just naturally knew our lanes. His is the technical side. Mine is the performance and, and acting side. And so we knew where our strengths were. So I was able to stay in my lane, so to speak, and he was able to stay in his, where I'm not going to interfere with what he's doing because I don't know much about lenses. I don't know much about lights and all that stuff. I do know how to give a performance. And so and I know how to get a performance. So it works really well in that regard. I would say the biggest challenge would be um, when we have, I guess, different concepts on how something should be done. And, but most, most of that was taken care of during the writing. Um, we often have different concepts and sometimes I'll, I'll write something and my wife will look at it and she'll say, Z would look at it. Z would look <laughs> at it and she would say, um, no, they wouldn't say that. And I said, well, why would that? Sounds great. But I'm thinking, you know, how I would like to hear it, but she's more of the authenticity mm -hmm. monitor. And she said, no, they wouldn't. They'd say like, oh, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. But, um, you know, you'd think there'd be a lot of drama between a couple <laughs> making a film together and, Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, there, there was there's more drama in front of the lens than behind, which is which where is, it belongs. But you know, if you've been on a lot of film sets, there's a, often quite more drama behind the camera than in front of the camera, and this wasn't the case. Yeah, I, I, I wish I could come up with a good antidote, but we I just don't have it yet. Do you have plans to collaborate on another project? Yes, we do. In fact, we're collaborating on three projects right now. We've as got we quite speak. a few. <laughs> right now, the, the one that's on deck is. Um, Don't give away too much. I was going through some old writings and I came across a play that I had started uh, several years ago, oh, about four or five years ago. And I, I sent it to Z and she said, This is really good. Maybe you should do something with it. I said, okay, uh, yeah, this this is, I like it. And she knows the characters that it's based on. And so I finished the play last week and now she's going to work on um, getting attention to it and raising grants because she's going to direct it. Yes, yeah, so we're going to kind of get a development deal, uh, play development. So if anyone knows any theater companies, ideally in New York based or New York state based who do play development, we're here, we have a play. So we're, and I'm hoping to direct it. 
uh, it's a two-hander. It's very pretty much a two-hander. And then we're also wor working on a screenplay, a feature-length screenplay. That's something we're yes. collaborating on, and a children's story, a children's book that we may actually adapt into a to a film, an animated film. So we're working on three projects right yes. now. Yes. So play children's stories and, and a feature film. we have a feature film that's based around drama that takes place on a Brooklyn block and we're writing an expose of our neighborhood yes <laughs> and there's, there's new dramas every day there's no shortage of material in fact we have too much material so we, we have to whittle it down and the children's story is mm -hmm. um, the children's story yeah the children's story is essentially three stories one that deals with gnomes another one that deals with some childhood folklore uh, in Sierra Leone, and then another one that deals with the journey of a cicada. Okay. Where can we follow your work? Okay, my work uh, in front of the camera, you can definitely follow that on IMDB. Just go to Zainab Ja, IMDB. Um, you'll see the things I've done, like Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, Only Murders in the Building, um, The Blacklist, yes. Homeland and stuff like that. And in terms of in front of the camera, well, so far all I have is reunion. So you can follow us on on either my Instagram Instagram behind page. The yeah, behind the camera. My, you can either go to my Instagram page, which is at ladyzjah, ladyzjah.com, or you can go to Reunion Short Movie, at Reunion Short Movie on Instagram. So that's where you can follow my work behind and in front of the camera. So to follow what I do, um, I have two sites, one that's called timnaylor.com, and as nickel, A-Y-L-O-R, and that's my cinematography site. So you can get a sense of what I do and what I, I'm about to be doing. Also, I'm on IMDb under the same name. And then my directing site, uh, if you want to see all the, the different projects and other films that I've directed and wrote, that would be under T-S nailer.com t as in tim s as in sam n a y l o r.com and then my instagram handle is at t s nailer one i do believe okay one question any tips on how to produce a film festival Ooh, i do i actually <laughs> produced a festival during a, a lull in the pandemic, I think it was in 2022 mm -hmm. or 21. A lull in, in the pandemic, like the coronavirus took a break. Yes, yes. The virus took a little rest. Well, it was, <laughs> it was, it was in 21, I, I believe, in December of 21, there was a bit of a lull, and New York State was giving out a grant to artists, basically to keep them afloat, I think. And then uh, I, I, I took the grant, and I put on a film festival our festival was called Fistful of Films, and we held it at the Film Forum. And we... It was at the Quad Cinema. At the Quad. And we sold out, and we had standing room only. There but what was it you wanted specifically, people who were based in New York? Yes, yes. New York our, our, our festival, um, the, the catch was, it was only open to people who made, or filmmakers who are based in New York. So we're guaranteed an audience. and But also blind submissions right yeah, and and those blind submissions too meaning i don't want to know your name i don't want to know what you look like where you you know i don't want to know anything about you but your film and that you live in new york and that immediately attracted a lot of entries in fact I, the hardest part about the festival was watching films because there's just i was just overwhelmed but uh we got and i only booked 10 films but they were absolutely amazing so that's how did you go in terms of going to be more specific in terms of how do you go about setting how any tips on setting up a film festival? Oh yeah, okay. The, the the first thing you need with a film festival is a venue, but you but you just it just can't be a festival. What is your festival's theme? Is, yeah. Are you doing a sci-fi festival? Are you doing an AI festival? No one has done that. I'm sure it's around the corner. You know, run with it. <laughs> um, just give me ten percent, but. Uh, Anyway, or you're doing a festival about um, wilderness films or sports films. A so you mine, should have a theme. Is it, it, it should have a theme. A friend of mine started a festival about six, seven years ago called uh, New York City Drone Film Festival. And nobody was doing it. And he's, he, he's a drone operator, so he knows the drone community. And he's one of, he has this company called Yeah Drones. 
uh, Randy Slavin is his name. And the moment he put that post out, I said, this festival is going to sell out because no one's doing it. There's a lot of drone footage out there. And who doesn't want to sit in the theater and just be wowed by drone footage? And it sells out for like three days straight. So I say the first thing is get an original theme. Um, the other problem I have with film festivals, as someone who's been to quite a few, is if you don't fill the seats, you have no business being a festival. I, I have no idea what is the purpose of a festival that can't fill the house. And so you have to f figure out really innovative ways to reach out to your target audience to mm -hmm. get warm butts and seats. Um, we work off mailing lists, of course. Uh, you can work various group discounts. Um, but also, I'd say book local filmmakers because they're going to bring a they're going to bring a, a built-in crowd with them who can make it. And so that's us, Tim and Zainab, Tim Naylor and Zainab Ja. Thank you for staying with us and watching our film reunion. And you can see it on um, American Airlines, and you can follow the progress of the film, the reunion short movie at Reunion Short Movie on Instagram. Yes, and at some point later in the year, we'll, we'll be having a general release. We're not sure through what distribution angle, but if you follow us, we'll let you know. Yes. Mm -hmm.